Alex, thanks for joining me here at uh, Collision From Home. Uh, you and I have talked together a lot, and I feel like I know you pretty well, but I'd like for the audience to get to know you a little bit better. And maybe you could start off by talking about your background. Hey, Pat, how are you, you doing? Good to see you again. I uh, hope everybody's doing well at home. I'll give you the lightning round on the background. I uh, came to this position through a very orthodox, traditional path. Graduated with a liberal arts degree from Georgetown, which is an endless source of amusement for engineers here. They don't even know how I have a job here with that educational background. Uh, and I decided to start off my career working construction, which was great, a lot of exercise. Uh, then I was a Catholic high school teacher in Washington, D.C. for a while, which was great. Uh, then I went to law school back to Georgetown and then got a, a job with a firm out here in San Diego, which is co-located with uh, the, the home of uh, Dr. Seuss. Uh, and we represented Dr. Seuss, did a lot of various IP work, patent, trademark, copyright, trade secret, but there was nothing better than representing Dr. Seuss in a court of law because everybody loves Dr. Seuss. It was terrific. Best client ever, without any question. Uh, then I had to make the transition over to Qualcomm and ran the litigation group here at Qualcomm for quite a long time, and then uh, took over the licensing business in 2016. I love that story, Alex, and I can't help but to think about Dr. Seuss when you and I are talking, but uh, appreciate you opening up about your, about your background. Uh, so a lot of people know about Qualcomm and that it powers most of the smartphones that are on the planet uh, today, all of them, and if you include uh, the intellectual property, but can you give a little bit of a background about what does the company do? What does it specialize in? So people, when they think about Qualcomm, they think about the chip business for the most part. But um, I think to understand this company, it's helpful to go back to its origins. And so Qualcomm started as a research and tech transfer company. This company is essentially a research company, researching digital wireless communication systems. We actually developed a cellular system and licensed that technology before we ever sold the chipset. And some folks even say we became an accidental uh, chipset company because we had to build products to, to, to prove out the technology. So we really still are firmly, after 30 years or so, committed to um, developing new cellular systems and enabling new cellular systems and continuing to enhance from G to G uh, and transferring that technology both through the licensing business and through the product business. And you can think of it according to three timelines. We basically live by three timelines. Very, very early research, developing systems, developing enhancements to using essentially uh, radio frequency and architecting networks. And then there's a standardization timeline. where We push that technology into standards that people know of as the G's. Uh, and then there's an implementation timeline where we basically pull the technology through and actually make it work in the world both through our products and also um, working with carriers and, and device manufacturers around the world to make cellular technology uh, real and available. Yeah, so whenever we take for granted uh, 1G, 2G, all the way through 5G, you're essentially the company who has brought uh, most of the IP uh, to the table, and I find it fascinating. And you know, a lot of people can only relate to things they can touch uh, and, and they can hold, but really what I think makes that this industry go around is intellectual property. I always tell people, don't confuse R and R and D. R is different uh, than D. And that kind of brings me to my next question, which is what are some of the biggest challenges in either uh, explaining IP and explaining what... Um, what business that, that you run uh, at Qualcomm? So first of all, it's easier for people to just look at the products and relate to the products. And so what we do as a fundamental part of our business is so far in advance of any productization, it creates a little bit more of an abstract conversation. Um, and, and that makes the communication part a little bit more difficult. But fundamentally, because Qualcomm is committed to cellular uh, technology development, and fundamental research, we go back many, many years. So even with respect to 5G standards, for example, we're talking a decade ahead of the implementation of 5G standards is where we really start. And the biggest challenge that we face from a licensing perspective in attempting to describe the value of our intellectual property associated with that fundamental um, uh, development, that fundamental research, 
is explaining how that value translates out into the real world in terms of royalties. There's a tremendous negative narrative about licensing patents and, and royalties associated with intellectual property, including standard essential patents. But that negative narrative ignore, ignores some fundamental propositions on value. When you look at the technology foundation that's created through this research and associated intellectual property, and you look at, uh, for example, the top licensors last year in 2019, the royalties collected were less than $10 billion worldwide for the top licensors. But if you look at the value that was enabled in the mobile industry, just in terms of the devices, the operator revenue, um, the infrastructure equipment that was sold, that value is over a trillion. And when you look at the overall value of products and services that sit on top of mobile, that value is over four trillion. And so what happens when, when we create this, this technology uh, by doing this fundamental early research is we create this tremendous platform for value that exists. And the negative narrative is, well, 10 billion is too much of a slice of the pie of that four trillion. It really doesn't make any sense. And people lose sight of, the challenge is that people lose sight of how enabling this technology really is and how valuable this intellectual property is. Well, I'm always blown away by the risk that, that companies take. In fact, if you start 10 years in, uh, ten years ahead, it's sometimes really hard to know exactly what that end product is gonna be. And then people pull back on research, but Qualcomm uh, keeps uh, chugging uh, it out, which I think is admirable, admirable quite, quite frankly. And, and I think uh, also uh, I see it as an enabler of what the next big thing is going to be uh, down the line. So let's get uh, a little bit uh, more down to earth right now as it relates to uh, things like uh, COVID-19. Uh, right now, uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're not gonna be here uh, forever, uh, but, but I would like you to talk a little bit about how the crisis has changed the environment for 5G. Well, I think to the extent that there has been any doubt about the importance of connectivity, that doubt is completely erased. And um, you need, while broadband has done well, you need connectivity um, that really solves all of the problems. You need it to be ubiquitous, uh, you need it to be reliable, obviously you need the throughput, the speed, but you also need the security. And so um, work from home is going to become a new normal. I mean, companies are already reevaluating their real estate footprint. Um, and so how do you push the enterprise out? How do you push the enterprise out to a wireless connected environment? And 5G is gonna be extraordinarily instrumental in enabling that. Um, work from anywhere is going to be a new normal, not just work from home. So 5G is going to, to enable this, I think, new normal, uh, and it's going to enable it in a way that the enterprise, when pushed out to, to basically everywhere, um, is going to be, um, uh, see, we're gonna see reliability and security at the same time. So when we think of 5G, a, a lot of times we put it into just the mobile category. It's easy, we can see immediate benefit, uh, and it is true that 5G helps the smartphone business. But uh, is 5G a, a, a thing outside of mobility and smartphones? Absolutely. I think that's going to be the defining you know, differentiator between 5G and 4G. It's not just what it does for the smartphone business. It's not just what it does th in terms of throughput and, and capacity. Um, as we move into the new releases of 5G, because all of these generations have multiple releases, we're getting past the initial 5G release, re release 15, um, and into 16 and 17. And that is really intended to drive 5G into all adjacencies, all verticals, different industries. And you'll see 5G become essential um, basically everywhere. It's not what industries will be in interested, it'll be um, are there industries that are not interested because it's going to be um, you know, you know, very, in very high demand. The automotive industry, it's clear that 5G is essential and there are standards being developed specifically for the automotive industry. The vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to everything, V to X, is not possible without the innovation that's already been created in 5G standards. Smart buildings, smart cities, and you'll see uh, ports, utilities, um, other infrastructure um, that are gonna be connected through 5G connectivity. And, and the management of these, these uh, facilities will be 
will be revolutionized based on 5G. You'll see 5G in agriculture. You'll see 5G enhance public safety. It's going to, to just continue to spread to essentially everything and enable, I think, more resiliency and in, in both the way we manage these, these um, important infrastructures, but also uh, more resiliency in the economy. What I think uh, a lot of people miss about 5G, and I think as an industry, because we, we called it a G and, and they expected, okay, it's, it's faster and maybe a little bit uh, lower latency, I think it's going to really open this up for areas that I think uh, that, that we, we never thought of. Are there any other areas that uh, you see as promising uh, for 5G? Well, a couple of things. I think your, your first statement about it will open up to applications that we never thought of. That's absolutely true. I remember when we first had 3G um, enhanced data rates combined with GPS, and people said, well, what's the killer app going to be? Nobody could figure it out. Well, maybe it was going to be a game. Well, we've seen it. We've seen it happen, for example, Uber and, and ride sharing and these, these tremendous applications that are now so ubiquitous. Uh, people were scratching their heads saying, is there going to be use for this technology foundation? You're going to see the same in 5G, of course. I mean, what, what will happen with 5G as you push computing to the edge of the network, you enable you know, ultra low latencies, tremendous throughput, you're going to see, for example, new form factors in XR, um, uh, you know, augmented reality and virtual reality experiences using new devices and form factors that we've never really seen before, never really had the type of performance that we think we, we, we will get in the future. So uh, we're, we're coming to a close here. Are there any uh, words of wisdom you have for the viewers out there? But Qualcomm has a unique business model. We see that as a virtue. We, we engage in research that other companies don't want, to, don't want to do. We take risks that other companies don't want to take. And that's fine. That's our mission. Um, we want to keep doing it. The licensing business is essential uh, to that activity. It's fundamental to that activity. And we've been very successful at it. Um, we intend to keep doing it for quite a long time, from 5G through to whatever 6G may be in the future. So we're very happy to contribute to the technology development as well. We're very happy to contribute to the product side. Um, we're, we're tremendously excited to see what 5G uh, will do. And 5G will be uh, very fruitful for many, many years to come. And um, it's going to do a lot of good for for a lot of people in, in many parts of the world. That's great, Alex. I'm glad you didn't drop the uh, proverbial uh, 6G um, because we still have many, many years of, uh, of productization and, and rollout of 5G, but uh, it is glad to know that somebody is thinking about uh, the next 10 years. But I'm looking forward to the future, uh, Alex, and, and a future that uh, Qualcomm is in, investing in and I really appreciate your time. Pat, thank you very much. It was great spending time with you.